Hey everyone, welcome back to your favorite revenue podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rich, and today we have a very special guest. We have the EVP of Revenue Operations at HubSpot, Allison Elworthy. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Ross. Excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we're going to talk about some of my favorite topics, and I swear I didn't uh, share with Allison the ideas behind customer journey versus sales process and driving accountability on the field, some of my favorite things that we talk a lot about. I'm really excited to get her perspective and how she does this at an amazing company like HubSpot. But before we get into those, maybe a bit about Allison and her journey. Allison would be curious to hear kind of, you know, how you made the leap to kind of that VP level re- level, level uh, in uh, revenue leadership. Of course. So um, I've been at HubSpot for over 12 years, which is wild to think about. So wow. we were a true scrappy startup crammed into, you know, shared office space. And I've always held roles within the go-to-market part of the business. So I started, um, actually started in marketing and realized I was a terrible content creator. Uh, So quickly gravitated and and, um, led marketing operations, then moved over to lead sales ops, was in a general ops role for a number of years. Um, Before leading RevOps, I actually led uh, global customer success. So Mm -hmm. had ownership of our revenue retention number, um, and global team for about three or four years. Um, and then at the beginning of 2021, uh, our chief customer officer at the time, Yamini Rangan, who's now our CEO, um, had kind of tapped me to say, hey, I think we need to uh, transform our operations across go-to-market, um, remove some of our silos, find ways to operate more efficiently. I think it's time to form a RevOps uh, organization mm. within go-to-market. So had tapped me to do that, uh, where we aligned um, and centralized our ops strategy enable, enablement um, data and systems kind of under one umbrella, which we mm. call uh, RevOps when we formed the beginning of 2021. So I've always, um, you know, been very close to the revenue side of the business, um, have a lot of passion for go to market, uh, and has just been a really fun, exciting uh, couple of years creating uh, RevOps for HubSpot and, you know, driving change and impact uh, for the go to market teams. Well, sounds like an exciting, very holistic role. Um, and maybe early to start with the, the hot take question, but I'm curious to hear. Do you think it's possible to be a strong revenue ops leader without experience managing folks and leading teams that have been frontline? By that, I mean, you know, coming from a pure internal operations role, maybe not understanding what it's really like with customers. I'm curious to get your take on how that's informed your perspective. Do you feel like if you'd be able to do that without some of that experience? So I think you would be able to, um, but I think having experience of owning a number and leading a frontline team makes you uh, that much better of an ops, um, as an ops leader. And, um, you know, there's nothing like owning a number and having that quarterly, monthly quota and pressure and, you know, having like actually been in those shoes, you develop a level of empathy that's hard to build or create otherwise. Um, mm-hmm. And I remember I was I was VP of ops before I moved into the customer success role. And our COO at the time kept telling me like, you know, if you want to continue to grow your career in operations, you're, you've got to, you know, carry that. You've got to own a number. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Like, I'm fine. I get it. You know, I want to stay focused. I love operations. I loved ops. Um, and kind of like dug my heels in a little bit before I ended up accepting that role and was one of the best decisions in my career. Um, you learned so much uh, being on the kind of other side of the lines. Uh, and I feel like I am a much better ops leader uh, having had that experience. And now that I have that empathy and also just um, better understanding of our customers. I mean, I believe that in ops, yes, you serve the frontline teams, but you're ultimately serving your customers. And I think yeah. that oftentimes gets lost. Um, and having that deep connection and understanding of your customers, their sentiment, their challenges is really important um, in any types of, of ops role. Totally, totally. So people can do it, but definitely kind of helps you, I think, drive the empathy being in the shoes. I know it's like when I when we talk to RevOps, teams i just find the like pace to them getting it and understanding what their teams are asking for and why and what their customers are saying is just that much faster usually to have that intuition from being that person and 
kind of reading between the lines, right? Totally agree. And I think sometimes it's a hard leap for ops professionals to take because, you know, if you are passionate about ops, there's a reason for it. Um, and, you know, leading a frontline team may not be, you know, at the top of your list. Um, but I think is if, if you are looking to build a career in operations, an important stop along your career journey. Totally, totally. Uh, good pit stop. Well, shifting gears away kind of from, from your journey and appreciate that, that perspective to some of the strategy and execution stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, so we always ask for three tactical tips ahead of time, and we'll dig into kind of what, what this means to you when you're um, driving this on, on your team at HubSpot the last 12 years. We talked about the customer journey, not the sales process. We talked about this challenging balance between digital first and human supported. So not pure self-serve, but also not pure top down, you know, human owned. And another tough balance, which is like enabling your front lot, your uh, field, but also driving accountability with them and kind of helping them, teaching them how to fish. Um, I think maybe a good analogy there. So wh wh which one are, are you most passionate about? Where do you want to start? Uh, all of them. I'm super passionate about it. Let's, let's start with the uh, customer journey. Cause I think that is like so foundational to yes. everything that you do. Awesome. Um, so my, my big first question, and this is something that we talk to a lot of teams about, which is kind of this reframing from the world that we, you know, when we look inward and we have meetings around our forecast, you know, percent likelihood to close our sales stages, all these things are very, you know, HubSpot or Accord focused rather than the customer outcomes. How do you think about orienting your, all of the processes internally and externally around the customer first, rather than what kind of seems to be the default, which is the sales process, right? Yeah. I'm curious to, yeah. to hear how you kind of get your team thinking in this customer first mindset. Yeah, we have this phrase at HubSpot that we want to be thinking customer in versus HubSpot out. And, um, you know, I've been at HubSpot for a long time. And as we can, as you continue to grow and scale and bring momentum, like you get laser focused on driving outcomes. And oftentimes your customers take a back seat. And I think it was when I was leading customer success, I was like, hey, wait a second, our priorities are off. Um, and, you know, we, we created under customer success, this voice of the customer team to really evolve how we think and, and, and operate. Um, we changed our staff meetings to be customer first meetings. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important that you keep the customer um, front and center. And so within, you know, when we formed RevOps, and as I was thinking about how we drive and measure the performance of the go-to-market teams, you know, we had our marketing metrics, sales metrics, CS metrics, and um, we kind of started from scratch and said, no, we need to think about, you know, the customer in lens and what would that look like? So we mm -hmm. created something that we call our customer centric operating model. CCOM is what we call it. And it's a framework for how we talk about our strategic initiatives, how we look at the KPIs that drive revenue for the business, how we drive accountability across our teams. Um, and essentially, it's a pretty simple customer journey map. And I'll pause here because sometimes I say customer journey maps and people build these like very intricate, you know, maps that takes years to create. And then by the time you roll it out, they're, you know, old, but we've yeah. kept it pretty simple. We look at attract, engage, delight. Those are the three kind of four stages, the customer journey beneath that we have sub stages um, and outcomes that we try to drive. And that's how we talk about our business. That's how we measure our business. We have monthly CCOM meetings where we look at all of the metrics we have clear folks that are accountable for each substage across the customer journey. We use it for our QBR, for how we um, communicate our performance more broadly out to the rest of the business. So it's been a pretty foundational move in terms of like how we just operate. Um, and everyone knows what the CCOM is across go to market and um, is the context for which we communicate and operate um, and has been pretty foundational. So from there, Everything that we do from strategic initiatives to driving, you know, action um, or turning around uh, performance or identifying an opportunity is from that, um, that customer centric operating model. Interesting. So one thing that I'm hearing from you that actually reminds me of conversations with other, you know, ex or current hub spotters is this language. Like there's a way of talking about it that feels like very true to the culture of HubSpot. It's, it's not... And that's something that, you know, I think is is very common in companies that kind of drive towards a cultural goal, right? And you have all these this language around it. But two, not just going towards those internal goals like your forecast and ARR numbers, but you have customer outcomes that you track. 
Do you mind sharing a couple of examples of what those types of things are where, again, it's less traditional internal metrics that you'd look at, but like you're tracking your customer success. What does that mean? Like them growing their revenue marketing numbers or like how would you measure that if folks were thinking about ways to kind of also create OKRs for the customer's success? Yeah. So like, you know, in the attract phase, like, are you driving awareness with your future customers and prospects? Like, it, is there a sense of awareness? Um, engage, you know, are your customers, uh, um, you know, considering your, like, what, what, what KPIs are you driving, you know, in your sales process? Are they engaging with you? And then what's interesting, the delight phase, which I think what you're getting at, it's like, you know, are your customers like getting activated on your product? Yes or no? Yeah, that's like, what I mean. Like, how are you tracking their success, not just your success in terms yeah, of- Yeah, exactly. Process, and yeah. so, right, as you go through that, like, like I think in that delight phase is so critical. Like, are they actually activating? How are they using, usage is key. Like, how are they using the product? If they're using the product, then they should be driving outcomes and, you know, driving more revenue for, for their business and helping yeah. their own customers grow. Um, you know, do they enjoy using your product? What is the sentiment like? Um, so, and that all kind of leads to your output, which ultimately is customer retention and growth. Mm -hmm. um, so that delight phase is really important to understand um, how are they getting value out of your product, which I think really comes down to, are they activating, are they using, um, because that will, if you've created a great product, um, help them to continue to, to grow their own businesses. Totally. I've seen a, a, a huge renewed focus on, as you call it, the delight phase, I think in the last 12, 18 months, um, as thing, you know, as folks have taken kind of a second look at budgets and spend what software they're using. I think a lot of times things, things used to hang around because it wasn't necessarily the focus. We're growing. We're not going to spend time ripping things out because, you know, it doesn't matter. We just need to send the next dollar right now. I think a lot of folks are looking at that and I think realizing they have this huge gap in their customer journey, which might not reflect their sales process of, yeah, what are those usage metrics? How is my customer? Maybe they're using it, but what level of success are they having? Is it driving outcomes for their business, um, which is really, really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And as a former CS leader, it brings so much joy to my heart that there's such a focus on usage, not just within the go-to-market organization, but the product organization. Yeah. Like this spans beyond just your go-to-market teams. Uh, and it's all about retention, right? It's all about usage. And um, in when you have macro conditions like we're in today, we were chatting about this earlier, retention matters that much more. Um, so I think it's a, a healthy... I don't know, we're, we're getting like a healthy uh, dose of medicine here um, to, to pivot our business and focus on usage. And that's going to help us, you know, uh, be more sustainable moving forward too, so. Totally agree. Well, maybe switching gears, we'll come back to the digital first piece, maybe as a way of the second, which is kind of that frontline enablement and driving accountability uh, with folks on the field. So curious to hear, you know, what are ways that you both help support but also kind of create a sense of what success looks like and what success doesn't look like with the large sales organization that is uh, HubSpot. Yeah, so I think about like the role of ops is driving data to insights to action. Um, and usually great ops teams are able to figure out, like take the data, bunch of smart analysts, get to a great insight. Um, yes. The hardest part is actually taking that insight and actioning it. Um, and I, I feel like it's been pretty easy to figure out, okay, we need to change X, Y, or Z or change this behavior and you pull the enablement team in, they roll out awesome training. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, it falls flat. And, um, I think one of the biggest challenges that go to, go to market organizations have, and, you know, that we've learned over the past year is just the importance of driving adoption and accountability on the front lines. Um, because it's hard, it's hard to really change behavior. And, um, I think RevOps can play a significant role here, um, in helping sales leadership drive accountability and adoption from the tops down. And that comes with your reporting and insights and, um, uh, being able to show the, the true impact of change management and driving a significant change across the field. So we've spent a lot of time on driving adoption and accountability um, this year. And it really comes down to a great partnership with sales leadership or CS leadership or whatever team you're trying to drive change in um, mm -hmm. and getting that joint accountability from the tops down and making sure that 
the team really understands the context and the why, and ultimately why this is good for your customers. Um, and uh, so we've had a lot of uh, great learnings this year, but um, you know that driving that last piece, insight to action, and accountability of the follow through. Um, is an area where I don't think historically teams really focus on. It's all about the lead up and the launch and the build up, yeah. whatever it is, a new campaign. And then you're like, okay, we're done. We hit that milestone. But the real focus and energy and calories that you put in should be post launch, for example, and making sure that you have the the follow through and, and what you're, what you're, the change that you're trying to drive in your organization. Totally. Another huge theme that we're seeing in the last 12, 18 months has been, I think, a lot fewer of these initiatives, but a focus on that. What you're talking about is the insight to action. And I felt like everything that I heard about from like, you know, SaaS vendors, everything was about data, 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 and insight, insight, insight. And now what I'm seeing is actually a focus on less of that and more of this accountability on the front lines and holding folks accountable from senior leadership all the way down, yes. um, which has been really, really cool to see. I think a lot of people are kind of building this muscle either up or from scratch. Um, so curious to hear if you have any tips or advice from for teams that are trying to drive this level of um, accountability, maybe teams that are rolling out a new sales methodology, maybe a new positioning framework, maybe trying to get tighter on their ICP. What are ways to drive that partnership between ops enablement and sales leadership that you said was so important? Um, some things that you found to be really helpful for that. Yeah. So, you know, I think obviously the data is important. I think a lot of our, we are very data driven. Data is really important. That needs to be there. The customer sentiment needs to be there. So like, what are your customers saying, you know, about the experience that you're creating within your sales process or go to market teams? And then the third piece is making sure you get the buy-in from the team that you're partnering with or supporting, whether that's sales or CS and um, really partnering with folks from leadership all the way down to the front lines and having and building that empathy and understanding what the challenges are that those teams are currently facing. What are, who are the champions that you're going to pull in to help you define the new methodology in this case or process that you're trying to roll out? So it feels like co-ownership um, because what you roll out, you want to make sure you have that co-ownership and support from a data customer and rep perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have that, I think it's important that you're you have an aligned set of priorities. So another role in, that RevOps plays is our strategic or is our go-to-market strategy. And we have a set core set of objectives and, and priorities and really getting alignment around it. Um, so then you know that, you know, your head of sales or CS is going to help drive that um, from top to bottom. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important to have those internal champions and build that empathy with reps as you're defining this new methodology that you're trying to roll out. Um, and then, you know, what's in it for them? You know, I think part of this is you can show, okay, here's the, you know, productivity lift we expect from this new methodology. And here's why show them the data. So they truly understand it. Um, and so it's a, it's a bit of kind of the, the bottoms up and top down and, and great reporting. So something we often see is when we roll out new, a new change or enablement, the folks that do adopt it usually show better outcomes. Um, usually, uh, sometimes we're wrong on that. And I think just having that data will get the rest of the organization to adopt it. Totally. Is there a stakeholder that you feel like is most commonly missed when it comes to successfully having some like major behavioral change or one of these initiatives for driving that insight to action? Is it, you know, sales leadership? Is it frontline management? Is it the sellers, customer input? What do you think is kind of most commonly missed to, to drive that change? Reps. Yeah. The frontline sellers. I mean, you have to really uh, get in their shoes and I think oftentimes when you come from this top downs approach, they're like, yeah, but you don't actually know what it's like to be on a sales call and why this part of the methodology won't work. And so I think spending a lot of time with the frontline teams, with customers, like more specifically with customers yeah. to like leverage that as input into whatever change it is you're trying to make, um, will build that credibility. I think trust and credibility is huge. I mean, you are rolling out a massive change that will impact a seller's commission, right? And so, um, you know, there needs to be a high degree of trust and credibility. And, and you get that by, um, you know, building, you know, empathy and understanding of your customers and reps. Totally. Yeah. I think um, it's sometimes easy to get distracted by that because a lot of times like ops, you're talking, you're in these meetings, right? Every day with the sales leaders and the managers and directors, and you're not spending as much time. But when you think about 
these behavioral change thing is not them that change anything that they're yeah. doing. It's exponentially more people when they're on the front lines dealing with customers. So I think that's a really, really good reminder. And we've honestly gone through this as well. We're like, if we're doing a launch of a core, we'll spend a ton of time obviously pitching to and selling to these leaders and building up these playbooks. And sometimes we'll skip the input from those top reps to get, like you said, the credibility of this is what it's like day to day. This is actually the thing that's going to drive the biggest outcome. And it's not actually from the VP. You actually want to get as far from that world um, and closer to the front line. So that's a great, great reminder. Um, and, and a perfect tie into kind of the third tactical piece we're going to talk about, which is the digitally led, but human supported stuff, right? So how do we think about partnering with these frontline sellers that are dealing with customers in a way that, you know, you're not necessarily having them do all the work with the client, but you're kind of building two products, right? You're building your core product, and you're also building this other product that's supporting these sellers. So I'm curious to hear how you how you think about that. Yeah, yeah, we, we've spent, we're spending a lot of time on this internally at HubSpot. I think, um, you know, it's interesting going back to the customer in versus HubSpot out. What we hear from our customers or a lot of buyers in general is that they want to do it themselves. They want to self-serve. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in their, I think, specific use cases where that's great and others that it doesn't work. So um, what we're trying to understand are what are what's that customer journey? You know, it all goes back to the customer journey. Where across that customer journey do customers want to self-serve across which segments, et cetera, um, and, and start with that because we want to ultimately solve for our customers above all else. Yeah. Um, you know, we also are very excited about AI. We talk a lot about AI internally. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes when we talk about having a more digitally led go to market motion or restaurant, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, um, but that's not yeah. exactly what we're saying, right? I think what we're saying is how do we leverage automation and AI to better empower our reps mm. to spend more time with our customers? I think the way that we're looking at automation and AI is how do we take the administrative um, non-customer facing tedious uh -huh. work, like how do we remove that essentially for our reps? Because I want our reps to be spending hundred percent of their time with and talking to customers and helping them through their journey, right? Both pre and post sales um, and not dealing with kind of the administrative tasks. So that's really how we're thinking about leveraging automation from that regard, because that will help us uh, spend more time with customers, drive, a better output for customers for HubSpot. Um, so we think about digital, you know, in those two through those two lens, um, which is exciting, uh, but is also hard, right? We're trying to drive yes. a self serve go to market, and at the same time, create a more, you know, deliver more automation to make our reps more productive. Um, you know, we've got uh, RevOps is driving, you know, partnership with the rest of the go to market. Um, pretty massive transformational change, um, but is it's very exciting to say the least. And are you using, is this very meta? Like are you using HubSpot in a lot of ways to do this because it's their CRM or like that must be an interesting kind of challenge and insight that, that you all get, right? Yeah, yeah, we are. It, it is very meta. So we do leverage, we, we run a big chunk of HubSpot on HubSpot, which is pretty cool. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is, We've taken this approach of do over delivery when it comes to AI. And so our our product teams, R&D are running fast at AI and, and rolling out features for our customers. We're running hard at it and across the go to market. And what's interesting is there's just so much overlap and crossover in terms of what are we going to use? We use a lot of HubSpot's features and functionalities for it. Um, on the flip side, our product org is learning from our go-to-market teams in terms of what we're learning, how we're hacking it together. And so yeah. Um, it's kind of cool to watch how this is evolving for us, not just within the go-to-market part of the business, but the broader, you know, HubSpot organization. Um, so yes, there is a lot of kind of, um, uh, I guess there's this flywheel effect that's happening uh, for us internally, which is really fun. Totally. Um, so would there be, yeah, one tip for, you know, maybe yourself five years ago that you've learned from kind of how to best support those frontline sellers with a digital first approach. And honestly, I was even thinking about it differently when you explained it, it makes a lot of sense. How do you kind of get them to spend more time with customers? What's something that you feel like sales organizations, whether it's pre or post sales is spending time internally that you could, and you have automated and made easier for those frontline sellers to kind of invest more time in their customer success. Yeah, I think any anything that's like administrative tasks or, you know, which customers should I spend time with and when and what should I talk about? Like 
we have, and, and by all means, we have very smart reps and, and it's important to make that judgment call, but we have so much data, like so much data that should be teeing up those, um, you know, it, that should really guide. So we, we talk about actually these investments as creating a more guided sales motion a more mm. guided success motion. Like we want to better guide and focus our pre and post, you know, sale reps on the right customers, the right activities, on the right conversations. And we should be able to take that thinking out of it. Um, yeah. That's what I mean by the administrative work. So um, that's really where we're focused is better guidance for our reps. Got it. So how can you move them away from maybe like intuition to like better data informed? Yeah, uh, exactly. That stuff. Okay, that's super helpful. Awesome. Well, to wrap things up in the last few minutes, we're going to move into my personal favorite section, which is going to be some rapid fire questions. So we're going to ask for like one word, if not one word, like one sentence answers to a few questions. Are you ready? All right, let's go. All right. What do you think the main reason most teams miss their ARR targets? They're not focused on their customers. Okay. Inwardly, not hourly. I love it. Um, Your favorite resource related to revenue leadership. It could be a book, a course, a podcast. Oh my God, you stumped me. You stumped me, Ross. Uh, I listen to a lot of, there's not one. I listen, here's the thing. There's not one because I think RevOps is a relatively new function yeah. uh, for many companies and a lot of people are trying to figure it out. So I listen to a whole host of different podcasts. I've read a bunch of different books. There really isn't one in my mind. And um, I think it's it's exciting just to learn how other people and other companies are learning. Totally, totally. Um what do you think the number one challenge for revenue leaders in 2023 has been? I think how to navigate the macro conditions um, from a, you know, just performance and, you know, driving revenue perspective from planning to be able to action. Um, the macro climate has made made it really challenging. Totally. A lot of uncertainty. Um, well, this is a very personal question, but uh, the best segment to focus on as a company SMB, mid-market, or enterprise? Oh, my gosh. I think SMB because it's one of the most SMB, mid-market, just because enterprise is so well-established. I think people understand the levers and mechanisms to drive outcomes. I think uh, what's really exciting about SMB and mid-market is we're, people are, companies are still trying to figure it out and to drive a sustainable and efficient growth in, in these segments. Um, I I am passionate about, about that segment. <laughs> All right. Probably the hardest question here. What do you think the most important organization on the revenue side is? Sales, CS, or marketing? I'm going to go with CS. As a former CS. I I like someone having an answer for this. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. And I I feel passionately about this. And um, I think it is one of the most challenging parts of the uh, business to understand in terms of driving retention, upgrades and downgrades and uh, gross retention and understanding the leading indicators of that. Um, and I think oftentimes it's thought of as an afterthought, but should really be where the, you know, really uh, uh, where the focus should be in your business and driving usage and delivering value for customers. And I think, I think I was starting to see that shift and change. Yeah. Um, so that would be my answer. Love it. Um, and uh, yeah, there's definitely a renewed focus in it, uh, which is great to see in the market. Last two questions before we wrap up here. Uh, the best way to unplug from the demands of revenue leadership? Spending time with my family. Awesome. And the road to successful revenue leadership is paved with fill in the blank. I think just Ready new playbook. I think we're turning. We're we're. This is a new creativity. chapter. How come? Yeah. yeah, I think creativity. How how revenue organizations are going to grow is going to be different. So I find it as an exciting uh, time. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, before we wrap things up, if folks want to get in touch with you, um, what would be the the best way? LinkedIn, something like LinkedIn that. LinkedIn would be great. Cool. All right. Well, we'll add your your profile to the to the post show notes. But thank you so much, Allison, for for. Uh, spend your time sharing with the community all these uh, lessons and and great thoughts. And hopefully people can take this to their 2024 planning sessions and figure out how to be more customer focused, uh, digital first and drive accountability with the field. Thanks so much, Ross. This has been fun.